Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Benito, Steve Ayadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, and we've got two new patrons. Everybody welcome Scott and Leonard. Yay! On this episode of DTNS, Instagram wants to get to the heart of teen mental health. Generative models have a user privacy problem, depending on where you live. And is Verizon's Olympic bundle the right bundle for you? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 18th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us today is Charlotte Henry of the Edition Newsletter and frequent guest on the show. Welcome back, Charlotte. Hello. So lovely to be back and see you guys. Well, it's lovely to have you. Uh, we're excited to talk about uh, streaming bundles. What do they mean? Which one is right we have, for you? We, we'll be bundling in a conversation about bundles. We will be, yes. And it will include sports. Of course well. it is, because I'm here. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, Charlotte's sports. Obviously, you know. we're here. It's, you know, Sarah and I have been allowed to make a contribution to show notes. <laughs> sport is happening. Correct. All right, let's get into the show, and we'll start today, as we always do, with the quick hits. We previously told you that an open data set from a nonprofit called Eleuther AI was found to have possibly used YouTube data without permission in its training data. The data set was used by big companies like Nvidia, Anthropic, Apple, and Salesforce, which brought into question how much those companies might have known about the data they were using. Apple has now responded that the data set was used in its open ELM model and that the model was only used for research purposes, not for anything Apple intelligence related or even anything product related that the public might use. Apple also said it doesn't plan to continue to develop its open ELM model at all. Google Messages may soon support higher quality image transfers over RCS. Currently, it resizes and compresses images well below the capabilities of the RCS standard. Android Authority notes that in a recent message, Google Messages shrunk a 50 megapixel 6, six megabyte image down to just 1.9 megapixels and 147K. But an APK teardown of a new build of Google Messages shows a fresh approach to image transfers with compression and resizing options tailored specifically for RCS. This puts Google Messages on a par with Samsung messages and presumably Apple's implementation of RCS. OpenAI is launching at GPT-40 Mini, a smaller version of the full GPT-40 model that costs less to run. It also replaces GPT-3.5 for free, plus, and team users, with enterprise users getting the same starting next week. GPT-3.5 will continue as an API for developers, but they can also use GPT-4.0 Mini as well, which may be advantageous by reducing overall cost. GP-4.0 Mini supports text and vision now and will add multimodal capabilities for generating images, audio, and video soon. Nintendo is making an official charger for Joy-Con controllers so users don't have to charge them on the Switch itself. The new charger puts into the Switch a, into the Switch's dock USB-C port um, or another USB-C charger. If you don't have a Switch, the Joy-Con charger can be used as a standalone charger. No word yet on pricing, but it arrives on October 17th, more than seven years after the Switch's initial release, so better late than never. <laughs> Apple is launching a slew of new immersive video content designed for the Vision Pro over the next few months, including one from the music artist The Weeknd, a close-up view of the 2024 NBA All-Star Weekend, two different kinds of weekends, and a scripted short film. All will be exclusive to the Vision Pro, where users can watch 3D video with a 180-degree field of view. Boundless is also a new series that invites viewers to experience a once-in-a-lifetime trip to wherever they are, as Apple describes it. Uh, that actually uh, airs tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, July 18th. There's also a big wave surfing show from Red Bull. And Apple says that more series, films, concerts, and sports captured in Apple Immersive Video will be released later this year. And those are the quick hits. All right, let's move on to Instagram and how the company is... Moving forward to tackle the question of mental health, especially on, among its younger users. So the company has launched a pilot program in partnership with the Center for Open Science that will let a select group of researchers access its Instagram data to study how the platform affects the mental health of teens and even young adults. 
Now, researchers are going to get access to Instagram data for up to six months, which may include information on how many accounts a teen follows, how often they use Instagram, and for how long, their account settings, and others. But the data will not provide access to a user's specific demographic information. It won't include the content of their posts, their comments on other people's posts, or their messages or DMs uh, between them and others. Now, this is, is interesting be, for a few reasons, um, because the scientists who are interested in being part of the study can apply for access to the data through the Center for Open Science. The center will approve up to seven proposals in areas related to mental health of teens. Meta cannot approve the studies. So Meta can't, uh, you know, at least in theory, pick and choose, uh, you know, the folks that they would like to be part of the study. Uh, if uh, a teen is, is, uh, uh, chosen uh, by a researcher. The parent of that teen also has to agree to the study, so this is all pretty above board. Um, and if they do, the scientists will get access to some, again, of those subjects' data for up to six months. So uh, I, I guess I guess my question for you, uh, Rob and Charlotte, is at this point, Meta has a problem with certain folks who say, yeah, well, this is just, it's just not, it's not good for young people. You know, it's, it's making them depressed. It's making them sad. It's making them feel, you know, competitive with others. It's making them, you know, do worse in school, all that stuff. If we can get to the bottom of how much that is true with a study like this, which sounds like it's being very thoughtfully um, uh, acted out ahead of time, that's great. But then where do we go if, if the findings are, yeah, Instagram is actually pretty crappy for young kids. <laughs> that company's not going to shut down. Yeah, I, I, I'm I think. Up. I, go, go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead. No, you go on because I'm about to be rude and cynical. So you bring your rays of shun, sunlight to the conversation, then I'll bring everyone's mood down. So what what I believe is happening, um, it, at least in part from Meta's standpoint, is that they are trying to get some goodwill here and maybe trying to get out in front of this because we have been now hearing for a, cu a couple years that social media is just not good for the mental health of young people. And if that, if that message keeps getting hammered home and it doesn't look like the company is doing anything to try to counteract it, to try to make their system so that it does not adversely affect, uh, you know, young people, then you, the government's going to step in. And what we have seen in the past is that when the government sees things that particularly uh, bother children in a lot of ways, they kind of go hard. I mean, you, you've seen just like, you know, seat belts, car seats, cigarettes, uh, you know, vape pens, all, all that kind of stuff that is not good for children. They tend to regulate the heck out of it. So um, I think that a big part of this is Meta saying, let's get some goodwill by showing that, hey, let, you know, we, we, we understand we there's care. an issue. Let's go figure it out. We yeah. care. And also, um, can we get this information back so we can actually figure out what we need to do to address it as compared to, you know, being an ostrich with their head in the sand and then getting regulated, uh, you know, to the nth degree. OK, so Rob was nearly as cynical as I'm going to be. I do think there's a little bit of self-preservation going on here, right? The companies know Look, I've watched the hearings from your politicians on just as you guys have. We know that politicians on both the UK, in the EU, in you and of course America, we've seen those Senate hearings, are really drilling down into meta Instagram on all different angles. And it I agree with Rob here. This is them trying to get out in front of a potential issue, isn't it? I'm going to be fascinated to see what happens when, cause, because surely we're going to get information back that says X, Y, Z about Instagram is not very good for young teens. I would say particularly young girls, but not only. And so I, I just can't imagine that there's going to be some negative that, you know, nothing negative that comes back that they're going to have to deal with. So the response is going to be fascinating, right? What are yeah. they going to say? No, you can't have filters to make yourself look good. No, you can only put like pictures where you don't look great on Instagram. Like, how is this, going, do you know what I mean? To make your friends feel better. How How is this going to be regulated, navigated? I just can't quite tell what the, I think we all know what we think the report is going to find. But what is the response going to be? 
Exactly. Well, so right now, Instagram, you know, and parent company Meta um, will suggest that, uh, especially younger people, you don't you don't spend too much time on the app. Too much time on the app tends to end up, you know, a- affecting you adversely. Okay. Well, that's not true for everybody, but that's that's kind of a hey. Why don't you just self regulate yourself? <laughs> you know, like just just don't hang out on the platform too much. I mean, that and clearly we'll send you is some notifications. Clear, we'll send clearly, clearly not screen time notifications. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that that might be the answer for some folks. Clearly not the answer for all. Um, it's worth noting that again, Meta can't approve the studies, but the Center for Open Science can, um, and is using a registered reports publishing model meaning peer review of the research questions and methodologies before the data is collected is happening to help reduce bias and promote transparency. This all seems like a good idea. It seems like good information for everyone to have. What a company like Instagram does, I mean, they're not going to take away filters. Mm. I, no. or, or, or if they are, yeah. then Snapchat needs to do the same. I, you know, th- then, then we get on, you know, to uh, kind of a whole different conversation about what uh, social networks should do and not do. The, the study or, or should say the reporting of the study, it made it clear that Meta does not get to actually cherry pick who is going to be studied. They, they, they don't, yeah. they don't get to touch that. I wonder, however, how soon do they get access to the results of the study? Do they get mm-hmm. it before Earth gets it? Do they have the opportunity to create a response to it before the rest of us hear about it? I don't, nothing that we saw says anything about that, but I do wonder those things. Maybe, maybe uh, Charlotte, I'm, I'm a little cynical on this too. Good, I'm glad I brought you down with me. I, I just think <laughs> there's an element of this where Meta is legitimately trying to be a good citizen. There's a part of it where, as it always is in these cases, where it's trying to protect itself. I don't want to go too extreme, but it's a bit like the, uh, you know, tobacco companies advertising and telling you about anti-smoking measures, right? Ultimately, they still want you to use their products one way or the other. Right. Well, it's it's all just, you know, hey, we're great. You know, gasoline company. There's lots of companies sure. who are like, hey, right. we, we're not the bad guy. Don't Don't overdo it, but still buy our product. Totally. Totally. So we've been talking about Meta. Let's keep talking about Meta because Meta Platform said on Wednesday it decided to suspend the use of generative artificial intelligence tools in Brazil in response to the government's objections to its new privacy policy regarding personal data and AI. It also said it won't release its multimodal Llama AI model in the European Union due to the unpredictable nature of the European regulatory environment. Eventually, excuse additionally, Apple said that it probably won't roll out Apple intelligence in the EU due to the DMA. So my question for you, Charlotte, is artificial intelligence really bad for consumer privacy or are the consumer data protection laws really bad for AI? Probably both. Is that a bit of a cop out answer? Like, no, we've seen this. I, I, think, I think you're this right. Is, I think it's a little bit. This is a growing problem with the EU as a former resident of the EU till, you know, a few years ago. Um, and a not willing exit from the EU, from on my point of view, we have. I have noticed things now, whereby the tech is different. That I get different tech than they do a couple of hours away on a train in France. Right, that is happening now. I, you know, your messaging talk about Meta threads rolled out in England a year ago did not appear in the EU countries just a couple of hours away, because the. Meta doesn't want to have to deal with the EU regulatory environment, which is increasingly confrontational to it. That, that It just is. You can agree with it or disagree with the approach the EU is taking, but that objectively looks to be true to me. So there's that. And the companies are getting to the point where they can't be bothered with the fight. Clearly, that's what's happening. And with something as important and integral to their future as AI, they don't want to have to be bothered with the fight they i think part of it is also they want consumers to get annoyed and put pressure on political leaders to relieve the law so that they can have access to things that the rest of the world has i mean the example you brought up rob of apple intelligence is fascinating because as we all know apple one of the things it is obsessed about is making its products the same across the globe right it wants that you know it look at apple tv plus it wants the shows you have in one country to be the same as the shows you have in another country not the same as street in other streaming services it wants everything in 
iOS to be the same in one country and not the other. And slowly over the years, because of lawsuits and regulations, that's breaking down. And given how important it clearly thinks Apple intelligence is to its future, it's you know prepared to take a chunk of the world out to make it what it sees, I assume, as the best it could possibly be elsewhere. This really, it, it, it starts to, I mean, first of all, you're, both of you are right. I mean, if a, a large company, the size of Meta, I mean, doesn't get any larger than that, right? No, if really, Meta's no. like, yeah, we're just, it doesn't make sense for us to stay in the Brazilian market. It just doesn't. Uh, it means that uh, the number of users uh, does not, uh, you know, does not um, come above the time and energy that the company would have to put into whatever product needs to be uh, the what would be appropriate in Brazil. OK, so, you know, that's that's just one market. We see this, obviously, in the EU as well. Um, and many companies just say, yeah, I mean, OK, we can we can tweak things here or there or we can just pull out of the market and or they're forced to because the the you know, the regulars in that particular market uh, simply you know won't agree to terms of a new deal. But it, it does make me wonder a few years from now, uh, and as we are going to continue ha to have regulation, especially around AI, how much a global market will seem a lot more fragmented? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if because with AI, in a lot of ways, these companies aren't pulling out of markets. They're just not entering them. Apple right. intelligence is just not going to show up in the EU. Um, you know, you know, Llama Multimodel is just not going to show up in the EU. So I think, Charlotte, you might have hit the nail right on the head. A big part of this might be these tech companies saying, we're not going to bother with you now. We're going to let your people put pressure on politicians to maybe change some of these laws. And then once we really figure out how to make a lot of money with these things, and in, in we've exhausted everything everywhere else on Earth where we can operate, then we'll come back to you because there's additional dollars to be made there. So um, I, I think that that's how these companies are looking at this at this point. That's really what it seems to me. And of course, the most important thing with all these AI models is having data feed into them, right? So it doesn't want anything, any, it doesn't want to have to operate with restrictions. If it can operate more freely in other markets, even huge ones like, like Brazil is a huge market. There's a hell of a lot of people in Brazil. Meta products are really popular in that country. But if it can take the hit on that to get the most out of the products elsewhere, they obviously think that's a balance that they should strike. I mean, it's going to be really interesting how fragmented these kind of the next era of the Internet is. Well, uh, some people feel like the Android experience is fragmented and others do not. If you want more Android in your life overall, Android Faithful covers all of these topics. It is the podcast to get. Every week, Android aficionados Ron Richards, Gwen Hui Dao, Michelle Rahman, and Jason Howell bring you the latest in Android news products and all-around good information. You can watch it live Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 5 p.m. Pacific, at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Um, they're a fun group. You watch them live if you can. And you can also subscribe to the feed at androidfaithful.com. Welcome to additional conversations on DTNS with Charlotte Henry. So, Charlotte, I think this story might be right up your wheelhouse. Verizon is launching a Peacock Premium and Netflix Premium bundle ahead of the 2024 Paris Olympics, according to The Hollywood Reporter. Customers who sign up for the $80 Peacock Premium plan for a year will get one year of Netflix Premium valued at $275 thrown in for free. Uh, the bundle is available today and is going to stream all of NBC's Olympic coverage and live programming. Now, Charlotte, that's a lot of programming. What are people's options for watching the Olympics on streaming services? And does this bundle feel like a good deal to you? Well, I mean, it's taking a lot of money out of your net. I mean, it's essentially subsidizing Netflix premium if you're in the US. So that's a pretty nice way to get it. I mean, the way the Olympics is going to be shown completely varies where you are around the world. Here in the UK, it's going to be on the BBC because it sort of has to be. Um, and therefore the BBC iPlayer, plus Eurosport will be showing it, which is Discovery Plus. So there's a lot going on there. This bundle is kind of, I think, to me, indicative of the way things are going to have to go. How many times have we had the conversation about how many services do I want to subscribe to? Oh, it's too many. Right. I don't need all of these, blah, 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 blah. We've had this conversation so many times, right? 
And I think rebundling, we're going to see a lot more of it through the end of 2024, going into 2025. Obviously, the Olympics specifically, let's just focus on that for a minute, is a very big deal for Peacock, right? It's really, they bought it, they bought the rights, really is a way to draw people into Peacock, which, as you guys know, the numbers were okay, but they're not earth-shattering. And they're trying to have a really big year thanks to the Olympics. So obviously anything that gets people signed up to the service, which let's remember there's plenty of tiers of that that have ads, is obviously a really big deal for Peacock. You know, they just want the numbers, right? We saw... uh, Did we discuss this, Sarah? We saw... The NFL game that was on Peacock did really well, didn't it? Yes, it did. And so I think they're trying to use the Olympics in the same way. Yeah. So here's my question, Charlotte. Uh, Netflix is still the big dog pretty much everywhere in the world. And it's $275 a year. So if you can pick up, if you want to watch the Olympics and you can say, I'm just going to pay $80 to get Peacock, but I get a whole year of Netflix. Is that a good deal? I mean, it sounds pretty good to me. You not up for it? I've got them. I've got both. Pe- you know, I've got them both. Uh, so yeah, no, it, I know. But you're like me, and you I need feel help like this because- is a really good deal. Now, if you're it like, seems- I don't care about Netflix. It just doesn't matter to me. Then <laughs> it's, it's almost like the uh, Amazon Prime conversation we had in GDI the other day, where it's like, if you don't want the vacuum cleaner, then don't buy it on sale because you don't want it anyway kind yeah. of thing but it this if you if you for whatever reason don't have netflix premium uh it is it, it's a lot of free money i wonder I, I have to assume that both companies are hoping that it just makes someone fall in love with netflix and just never want to cancel that service so once the year is over they continue to pay what well- it is intriguing that Netflix is happy to, to be part of this, though, isn't it? We kind of always think that Netflix doesn't have to do anything to get consumers. It's the streaming service everyone always has. And yet it someone at Netflix was happy to be part of this bundle as well. I find that kind of fascinating. Yeah. you. you I, have I, want- to, I would assume that if they're probably going for the person who's like, I don't care about Netflix. And so it's like, well, but you get it for free. Uh, you know, and and that person saying, well, I care about the Olympics, so sure, I'll take the free Netflix, and then decides, you know what, I really do like it, and I was never going to pay for it, but you've you've convinced me. I, I think you're right on that because Netflix is kind of almost at critical mass. I mean, most people who are going to have Netflix probably have Netflix because they wanted it. it, it now they're into the realm of well, we've got to get them to want something else and just get Netflix, and maybe they will like it. So I, I, I kind of think that that may be what's happening here because these are probably customers that Netflix is not in fear of, well, if we wouldn't have done this bundle and they, they would have just signed up on their own. I think that that's not really the case for them at this point. I also yeah. wonder, uh, you know, I, I obviously the Olympics haven't started yet. I wonder how the offering is going to be for the end user. Let's say I say, all right, I got 80 bucks. I'm going to go Peacock premium. I want to watch the Olympics, which I do. So I probably will uh, take advantage of this. I remember it was 2010, I guess the London Olympics, or maybe it was 2012 was the London Olympics. So maybe 2010 was Vancouver. One was Vancouver would have been winter. No. So it would have been 2012. So the London Olympics, I, 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 (laughs) In the morning, just, you know, my regular routine, I used to go to my neighborhood gym and I would bring my iPad and um, the iPad for, I don't remember paying anything for the the streaming stuff, but it was some sort of NBC plus type thing where you would get, you, you wouldn't get like commentary or any like real packages. You would just get like raw feeds of certain sports. Nice. And even even like, you know, the gymnastics uh, team warming up type stuff. It was very raw, but very I was like, this is great. Um, but it was also kind of a mess. I'm going to assume that uh, they have a bigger plan in place for what you're actually going to get, you know, so that people don't complain about paying those $80. Oh, so- I think Peacock's gone really big on this and is really, really determined to make this like a real big introduction for a lot of people to peacock i have to say the more i read about this bundle i think it's a phenomenal bundle 80 dollars for a year of peacock and netflix like 
Peacock as well. Also, if you're into sports, has the Premier League has Premier League football on it. Almost every game of that. I it's a hell of a deal. Yeah, it really is. So, so here's here's another question. Do, do you think that that bundles are just kind of like the future of where streaming is going? Because it seems like for the last you know six, eight, ten months, all we've been hearing about are all these different services that are bundling with each other. I know me, I am a serial churner. I will quit a service in a heartbeat if there's nothing that I'm watching on it in real time. But if Mm -hmm. it's bundled with a bunch of other stuff, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I I really feel that the the great rebundling is underway. I think that's definitely happening. Well, um, this is a bundle that uh, that you might you might like or might not like. Uh, if you have thoughts about <laughs> whether you think this is a good idea or there's something sinister going on, uh, <laughs> send us an email. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, speaking of feedback, we got some feedback from RJ, again, talking about our Amazon Prime conversation and GDI on Tuesday's show. RJ says, one thing I do during Amazon Prime days is look for Prime deals on items I normally buy on Amazon. Uh, RJ echoing the sentiments of, of a few of us that day. When the Prime sale is running, I'll click on the buy again button on the Amazon toolbar, scroll through items I normally buy, looking for that red Prime deal label next to items I would buy anyway. Sometimes the deals are good, sometimes not. The other thing I do is look at gift cards. During Amazon Prime Days, Amazon might offer gift cards for places where I shop at at a discount. In the Amazon toolbar, you can click on Prime Day Deals on the left side of the webpage under Department, select gift cards. For example, PetSmart offering $10 off a $100 gift card. I like buying gift cards at a discount because this lets me make my own sales. Hope this saves you a couple bucks. Well, thank you, RJ. I shop at PetSmart quite often, so uh, I'll look into this. Yeah, we definitely want to thank RJ for the email. And we also want to thank Charlotte Henry for showing up and hanging out with us for a half hour. So, Charlotte, tell us what you've got going on over at the edition. I love hanging out with you guys. Yeah, if you enjoyed our conversation about streaming and the crossover of media and tech and all that stuff, I cover it all the time over at theedition.net. And you can subscribe to the paid newsletter at newsletter.theedition.net or just head over to the website. Everything you need is there. And uh, if you want to chat on social media, find me on almost any platform at at Charlotte A. Hedry. Excellent. Well, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. (laughs) We're going to talk about cash and also the amount of cash that you need to buy a stegosaurus. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, kind of. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with a Z Flip 6 review with Aya Zakhar and Lynn Peralta. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>